Welcome to the Natural Super Kids Podcast, where you will discover practical strategies to inspire you to boost the health and nutrition of your kids. I'm Jessica Donovan, a qualified naturopath specializing in kids' health, and I want to make it as easy as possible for you to raise healthy and happy kids. Let's get into it. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have a special guest, a friend of mine and fellow naturopath who I call the Queen of SIBO, and that's exactly what we are talking about in this episode today, SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It is an imbalance that happens within the gut, and Carly will delve into all of the details of this in this episode. So today we're talking specifically about diet therapy for SIBO, the common causes of SIBO, how someone knows if they have SIBO, as well as some of the key dietary changes that you can make if you do have SIBO. And of course, we'll talk more about, you know, how you can get Carly's support if this resonates with you. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Carly. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Yes, I'm excited to have this chat with you, the queen of SIBO. (laughs) But before we get into the topic of today, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be the the queen of SIBO, as I call Mm -hmm. you? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes, it all started when I was back as a student naturopath in my final year of studies um, and I had a case on SIBO. I didn't know what it was and, yeah, had to do a research project on it, went down the rabbit hole um, worked out that's what I had, um, and, you know, have had success with treating it personally. And it's been a lifelong thing I have to manage as well, because it is, you know, my digestive system is a weakness, but yeah, I wrote a book on it, sharing all of my resource with, um, practitioners. Um, and I was a generalist naturopath for about four years, just treating anything that came to my clinic. (laughs) And then, had my bub, um, who's now three and, um, came back from maternity leave going, you know what, this is my passion. This is what I love. And so I have niched right down into, yeah, helping, uh, people with IBS and SIBO. Um, and I also mentor practitioners, um, through courses and live mentoring. And I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to, you know, all things microbiome and SIBO. And I just, probably get a bit too obsessed sometimes. <laughs> um, but I just think that in Australia, it's not always fully understood um, and uh, disregarded too um, medically. So I'm on a little bit of a mission, you know, to make people with IBS realize that um, SIBO is real. SIBO is a thing and it is a hundred percent treatable. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and I have seen it time and time again in my clinic. Yes, love it. And you're so right. You know, so many people with these pretty awful digestive conditions go to the doctor, get told, oh, it's just IBS. There's not much you can do about it. Maybe get put onto a FODMAP kind of style diet and like, that's it. There's not a lot of, of solutions offered. So can you start by telling us, giving us a bit of a deep dive into exactly what SIBO is? Yeah, sure. So Uh, When we're talking about SIBO, it stands for uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so this condition primarily exists within the small intestine of our digestive system. And it is an overgrowth um, of bacteria in that area. So when we look at the small bowel versus the large bowel, our large bowel um, normally has a high amount of bacteria and we want that you know mm-hmm. it is an ecosystem of beautiful bacteria sometimes we can get pathogens in there and that's not the greatest but normally what we're looking for is a really healthy uh, ecosystem within the large intestine and that would be normal we want that however when we think about the small bowel we can get an over uh, overgrowth of this bacteria um, and these bacteria aren't wanted um, and they produce gases Um, like methane, hydrogen, and hydrogen sulfide. And it's these gases that cause 
all of um, the issues in patients who have SIBO. Mm -hmm. So that being constipation, diarrhea, constipation and diarrhea alternating, um, and primarily like the hallmark symptom of SIBO is the bloating. Mm -hmm. That, you know, as soon as you're eating, you're getting that bloating. Um, And this is where what we're eating uh, really directly impacts SIBO because mm-hmm. this bacteria that I'm talking about uh, consumes um, and requires a lot of our fibres and those high fodmapy like foods is what most people um, would know about, like carbohydrates, and they use that for fuel and then produce these gases in our bowel. And that's not, the, the food isn't the problem, it's the bacteria, um, but the food is like the fuel to the fire that's already burning. Um, so a lot of people think, I'll just start cutting out the food. But as we're going to talk about today, you know, there's a lot more that needs to be addressed. But essentially, an overgrowth of bacteria in a place where we don't want it, producing nasty gases and causing a lot of digestive symptoms. Yes, I love that. You've explained that so well. And I love that you talked about, you know, so many people that are struggling with these issues go, okay, well, I just can't eat that. I can't eat that. I can't eat that. And then end up on these really restricted diets, which then that that doesn't do any favors for their overall digestive health and um, and that sort of thing either. So as you're saying, that there's more that we need to look at when it comes to, to SIBO. It's a so, really passion of mine is that you know, a diet of inclusion versus exclusion mm-hmm. because the microbiome needs nourishment and yes. food and a diverse range of food. But when we're dealing with SIBO and trying to treat SIBO, there's an element of restriction that occurs. Um, so, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we just need to find this balance somewhere in the middle where we're not starving and restricting um, and we're also nourishing and rebuilding the microbiome. Yes. Great point. So how do people like um, get SIBO? You know, how does this this bacterial overgrowth happen in the small intestine? What are some of the common causes of of SIBO? There is a lot of different causes and contributing factors to SIBO. Um, The most common ones are infections. Um, so uh, a lot of travels, traveler's diarrhea mm-hmm. or gastroenteritis. Um, this is most implicated if you have diarrhea, so the diarrhea form of SIBO um, versus um, constipation. Um, and there's actually an autoimmune aspect that's happening there um, in the bowel. It's like attacking itself, um, the migrating motor complex, um, and there's antibodies that we're now finding that can be detected in the bowel. Um, due to that massive immune insult that occurs. Um, so if you're so often you're talking and Jess, you may have experienced this in your practice and you're like, okay, when did all of this start? Mm. You know, and you can track it back to like they went to Bali yes. and they got Bali belly or maybe they had a, you know, their kids were really young and they had just a year of really nasty bugs in their gut, um, in their household and that no one really recovered since. Like that's a really pivotal moment. Um for them and and that could be uh you know one of the causes of the SIBO developing and that microbiome imbalance that occurred um but there's so many other things simply like ongoing stress um you know poor diet um over consumption of different types of foods um and even things like structural um, so endometriosis um and um surgeries and stuff like that can impact um, SIBO. You know, uh, one of the examples, I've had a patient who had Crohn's disease, for example, and they had to have their bowel resectioned um, and lost part of their bowel and then it was rejoined and there was that retrograde flow of bacteria that was easily transferred into the small intestine. So there's those structural issues that exist as well. Um, but of course, the biggest <laughs> and most often um, talked about one is medications um, mm-hmm. and not just the typical ones that you're thinking about in terms of antibiotics, but there's quite a lot of research out there on things like PPIs, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, your SSRIs for mental health um, and and so forth, anything that has the ability to kind of affect the microbiome and or the motility, so the movement of um, uh, bacteria and, excuse me, the stool through um, the intestine 
is is going to have an impact um, on potentially, yeah, getting SIBO, which we don't want. <laughs> no, no. And there's often, I imagine, a lot of those different things at play for, for an individual person as well. Yes. And um, you, when you're taking that case and speaking or you're listening today, you're like, yes, tick, tick, tick. Even something like you talked about uh, infections, but mold exposure. Mm-hmm. So people up in northern parts of Australia, um, you know, are more prone to having SIBO purely because they're exposed to more mold. Um, and so many of the patients that I treat in those northern parts that have SIBO, um, I'm also treating for mold illness. So mm-hmm. um Yet taking that thorough case and working with a naturopath is going to do that and pull it all apart to kind of work out your timeline and your mind, your SIBO mind map um, Mm. is really important for you actually recovering from SIBO because unless you work out why you have SIBO, and it's such a great question that you've asked me, Jess, because if you don't work that out, you're going to relapse. So SIBO is a high relapsing condition, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got to really work at figuring out well, why did you get to the point where you had it in the first place and what else is going on in the microbiome and in your body systems that also needs to be addressed at the same time as um, working with the, the gut and the actual overgrowth of bacteria. Yeah, so that that real holistic approach, and it's and this is why it's um more com- so much more common in adults than children. Like we've had a chat um for a masterclass for the Natural Super Kids Club on on SIBO, and yeah. talked you know a bit more directly about SIBO in children and testing in children and that sort of thing. So if you're a club member and you are listening, that masterclass is in the portal for the Natural Super Kids Club. But I remember you talking about the fact that, you know, it is much more common in adults because it really, it it develops over time, SIBO, right? Like it's not just, not there one minute and, and there the next minute. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's, um, it is a hard one when talking about kids because we don't have enough data on it mm. purely because of all of the restrictions in terms of testing and, um, yeah, the validity behind all of that. So we mm. don't know enough about it in the children's population. But when you think about it simply about the exposure um, and the amount of years where uh, a child versus an adult has had that exposure or the potential for those causes to cause SIBO, mm. um, it's more likely to occur in someone who's an adult and have had multiple insults or, you know, uh, issues that are going on and contributing to the SIBO versus a child. But, you know, if, if it if in a child it's more chronic and it's associated more with kind of like really chronic um, illnesses like cystic fibrosis or that mm. really failure to thrive type picture. So you can kind of quickly identify it, but it's really different actually to like, adults Mm. we don't see that you know they they're not typical things that we would make oh SIBO you know um in an adult we look at them quite differently so yeah 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 thank you for for clarifying that um and I do want to dive into like you know what we can do about about SIBO for those listening who are thinking oh maybe this is me but first of all I'd love to I'd love to just pick your brains on you know how does someone know if they have SIBO Mm, uh, the first thing like the, the yeah the first thing I would say is if you're bloated um you know this would be like I would be sitting there going okay I have this bloating and you know it's got patterns it's there every day um you know it gets worse when you eat food um typically you know that one hour to three hour after eating time frame because that's when it's typically hitting the small intestine um would be my first thing or if you're getting constipation and or diarrhea. Um, If you've been diagnosed with IBS, please get investigated for SIBO because up to 80% of people who have IBS actually have SIBO. And when you go through and get treated for the SIBO, the IBS symptoms no longer exist. Mm. I actually had a patient on my program um, she's still in there at the moment. She suffered for 10 years with an IBS diagnosis and it wasn't until we tested her for SIBO and have treated it that she's just got this new lease on life. Um, you can go and listen to the full um, interview uh, with Victoria on my podcast, um, the Nourish Gut podcast, if you want to learn more about her experience. But that's just one example of how, you know, IBS is actually SIBO. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I would say they're the typical, like, um things that you would think of if you had SIBO 
but also think about those things we were talking about before. Mm. Um, and if you've been exposed to those things um, and you were ticking a lot of those boxes, plus you've got the symptoms, then I would say the first step is to do a SIBO test <laughs> so that you can work out whether you have it or not. Yes. Can you tell us a li- little bit about the the SIBO test? Yeah, sure. So it's a, a breath test. The only way um, to work out if you have SIBO is via breath test. Um, and so you drink solutions uh, like fructose um, and lactulose. There's also glucose, but I commonly don't use this in practice at the moment because it's the uh, the solution that's going to least likely show up the SIBO. So I think it's more like I think it's under 5% of um, likelihood of uh, finding um, SIBO compared to if you were to do a fructose and lactulose combined. It's up to like 90, I think it's 96% or something mm. like that detection rate of SIBO. You could do all three and therefore have more of like a 100% detection rate, but it's not the easiest test to do. There's a lot of prep. You've got to take three hours out of your day to get it done. You've got to, you know, be around for taking a breath sample every 20 to 30 minutes. Um, So I'm very upfront with the, you know, it's Mm. not like just doing a poo sample where you take a sample of your poo, but, um, you know, if you're equipped with the right information to do the test properly, it is so worth it to have that um, diagnosis and to know um, whether or not you have it. And I will just really, 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 really quickly say, um, please, if you have been diagnosed with SIBO based off a microbiome test, you need to do a SIBO test. So um, a lot of the questions I get from practitioners when I'm mentoring is, oh, there's some species in the gut that suggest SIBO, Mm. like Klebsiella is one of those um, that's been associated with SIBO in a lot of research. But just because that patient has or you have Klebsiella in your gut doesn't always mean you also have SIBO. SIBO. It's not, yeah, a conclusive kind of test test diagnosis, yeah. No, so being treated for your SIBO based off a microbiome test alone isn't enough. You do need to do the SIBO breath testing. Um, but I will also say if you can do both, that's like music to my ears. I want all yes. of my clients to be doing both so that we have a really clear indication of not what's just happening in the small intestine, the large intestine because as we're going to talk a lot about in a moment when it comes to diet and diversity and the gut microbiome knowing all of that is really important we want to know what's happening in the gut um, because if we're going to use um, therapies like antimicrobials that's going to affect the gut the large yes right you want to be sure what you're dealing with really Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to those dietary changes. So can you tell us, and I know there's probably a lot in <laughs> the answer to this question, but I'd love to hear like a bit of a summary on the key dietary changes that you recommend to your clients with SIBO. Yeah. Awesome. So the most amount of research when it comes to SIBO exists around the FODMAP diet and or kind of like a low carbohydrate diet where you're removing these things from your diet and it can actually act as a form of treatment just with diet alone. I don't suggest that it's the only part of what you do. Um, However, it can act as like a starvation of the carbohydrate and the main fuel uh, for this bacteria that we were talking earlier on and therefore the alleviation of those gases and symptoms that the patient experiences. Mm. And this is why when people go on the FODMAP diet, they feel so good and they get this new lease on life. However, we can't be using this long term. Mm. Um, And it's really important that, you know, if you are someone who's been on a low carbohydrate diet or FODMAP diet for an extended period of time beyond eight weeks, um, you know, even six weeks is probably enough um, that you actually start to look at including those foods back in. And if you at that point still can't tolerate it, you haven't addressed what's actually going on and you need more than just a dietary approach to eliminating the SIBO. Mm -hmm. The other thing or diet that can be used is what's called the elemental diet. Um, And this is basically like a two-week treatment where all you do is drink a solution that has your basic nutrients that meets your nutrient requirements for the day, like your zinc and your magnesium and your protein, and it's like a a meal replacement. Mm. Um, And that in itself has been shown in some research. uh, It's quite more, I'd say it's more effective um, with methane-dominant SIBO 
Um, however, you know, most of the people who I'm like, would you like, I present it as an option. They're <laughs> like, what? You want me to just have a meal replacement for 14 days, maybe longer if we retest and it's not effective. And the thought of them not eating food, mm. it, it's really hard. So I don't think it's a popular first choice of treatment um, mm. or dietary um, option. But I did just want to mention it today because, you know, there is some really great research on it um, as an effective dietary strategy and it's short term you know yes. like it is only two weeks done and dusted um maybe you could tap on an extra week or two um if you needed to do another round of it if you kind of were close to eliminating the the bacteria on a retest mm. um but what I have found is that I, I've used the FODMAP diet and I've used the concept of a low carbohydrate diet for many years before I decided to develop my own dietary therapy for patients with SIBO because what I was finding was that there was this element of restriction and then people becoming stuck mm -hmm. and reliant on this restriction. Yes. And I saw that to be really unhealthy because not just for the um, microbiome but mentally, I just... Mm -hmm. And I had so many patients presenting to my clinic of being on the FODMAP diet for 10 years. Um, and there's also the biphasic diet, which is um, elements of what we're talking about today, low FODMAP um, and low carbohydrate. Um, but that also takes you to a point where it's like, okay, cool, you've got to like a, the second phase in the biphasic diet. Um, and then I just felt like my patients were still left in the lurch of like restriction. Mm. Um, and so what I've developed is a six stage, um, process and diet for my patients to work through. It's called the SIBO food roadmap. Um, and I am launching that and releasing it to practitioners, um, in the coming months. So I will share a wait list with you, Jess, that you can share, um, for any practitioner listening, who's interested, um, in doing the training, um, and learning more about how to use this for your patients. Um, so I've been using that for two years now with my current patients um, in my programs and it, it takes them through the stages where they short-term need to be um, eliminating these foods. But even in those stages, I'm being very, um, what's the word I'm trying to find, strategic about um, if they don't really need to be avoiding that food yeah. at that level. Um I don't make them do that. So yes, there that. are some really big differences between, you know, my SIBO food roadmap and the low FODMAP diet and even the biphasic diet and the low carbohydrate, like a more of a GAPS type diet as well, um, where it's trying to find that balance between restriction and then food inclusion. Um, and then these stages build and build and build until you get to the sixth stage where you've got this abundance of beautiful food back in um, and and really working with, you know, sometimes it's like literally I've got a list, I think it's in stage three, where it's like you can have now a teaspoon of something, yeah? Yes. So it's a but slow even, introduction. Yes, and building yes. them up. But it's very specific. It's all laid out there so that mm -hmm. because a lot of the people who have SIBO have high functioning anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Like and there's a lot of fear around food. So I found that these these people needed something that was like done for them, mm -hmm. really clear, and also kind of really showed them then how they could get to that place where they could eat all the food again mm -hmm. um, without having to navigate that all on their own and source recipes. So I've got, you know, over 100 different SIBO-friendly recipes in there as well so that it's all, yeah, ready to go so that you can just heal and get yes. focus on getting better rather than having to do all that extra work and invest so much time. Yeah, I love that resource because like you said, there's so many what ifs and like, okay, these are the foods I can't eat, but what can I eat and what recipes can I create? And so it sounds like you really have included, you know, all of that in there. And it really reminds me of our approach when it comes to things like food intolerances or, um, you know, atopic conditions like eczema. Yes, you do often need to like 
remove certain foods from the diet as you're sort of doing doing that healing work. But we don't want kids or adults to be off, you know, foods or on really restricted diets long term. So um, I love that you've developed something new for both practitioners and also for for patients that are that are going through this, um, you know, really challenging condition that is SIBO. Mm, absolutely, and I think it's going to really help practitioners as well because this mm. can be really hard um you know I, I i i made it out of my own frustrations as a practitioner of like we can do so much better you yes. know then kind of give them this piece of paper about the low fodmap diet tell them to follow that and let them work it out on their own mm. and not give them enough direction and support um and guidelines around how to introduce those foods and what to do when you have a reaction all of a sudden you're relapsing in your SIBO. So, um, you know, I had a million questions and a million emails over the years of like (laughs) supporting Mm, people through just the diet side that I was like, right, (laughs) I have to solve this problem. Yes. Yes. Um, And, you know, we we have to get to that place where we have a nourishing diet because otherwise our microbiome is going to suffer and then we're going to get health issues from that as well. So, yes, I think um, if you're someone who is on a restrictive diet, please reach out um, and work with a health professional who, you know, really understands SIBO and and the dietary side of it um, because, Doing the diet stuff is one aspect, but then also receiving the right treatment alongside that um, diet at the right times and intervals to make sure that you can then get to a place where you can add these foods back in is really, really important because otherwise you will try to add these foods back in. And if you haven't successfully, you know, we retest our patients basically before they get to go into certain stages of my diet. Yeah. Um, and they have to be SIBO free. And if they're not, will they stay there, you know, in that the stage beforehand um, so that they can get, yeah, effective. Yeah. So they don't get that that relapse of symptoms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes makes total sense. And, um, yeah, like the I, you've talked a little bit about it, but I just want to sort of um, reiterate that the problem with going on something like the low FODMAP diet long term, yes, it can be like really miraculous for a lot of people in terms of their digestive symptoms, but you're removing all of those beautiful, um, you know, fibers that are nourishing our, the healthy gut microbiome. So even though, you know, the, the FODMAP diet eliminates the the symptoms that we're talking about um, and the symptoms of, of SIBO, then you can get sort of, you know, longer term negative effects from, from being on a diet like that long term. So I love that you've kind of looked at that and come up with a solution. So can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you? Um, yeah. And what you offer, including the, this new program that you have for, for SIBO. Yeah. So the primary way to work with us is by our Nourish Gut program. This is where we treat our patients with IBS um, and SIBO. So you're more than welcome to book a gut health call and have a chat to us because we just like to make sure that um, you are the right fit and that you you do fit like the criteria for the program to make sure that we're getting you the right outcomes as well. Um, and in terms of the SIBO food roadmap, if you are you as a client, you're wanting to do that, that's something that is included in our um, Nourish Gut program. So if you test positive for SIBO, um, we will support you through that as practitioners. Um, it's not just myself. I do have um, a team um, and another naturopath who I work very closely with. So that's why I do say we. Um, <laughs> and um, if you are a practitioner, then I will share the wait list with you, Jess. We do have an upcoming uh, masterclass all about um, SIBO and diets. So I'm going to be presenting on the research behind a lot of what I've talked about today and the different diets and presenting a lot of the data to that educational level for practitioners. So that'll be in June. Um, um, so I'll share both the link to sign up for the masterclass and also um, the wait list to actually, I'm pr- putting together a training on, you know, how to use the SIBO food roadmap in your clinic and uh, prescribe it to your patients because it is a little bit different and I need to make sure that, you know, um, something that I've created gets, you know, <clears throat> put yes. out and and communicated to patients in the way that um, I do so that we can continue to get that good success that I've been seeing with the patients um, in our clinic. Yes. And I love that you've, you know, developed this, this, 
program that works so well for your clients. And now you're sharing that with other practitioners, which is so needed because it's such a complex condition um, really? that, that yeah, so many practitioners feel kind of out of their depth with. So mm. I love that you've done that. Thank you so much. We will pop all of those links in the show notes um, that Carly has, has talked about. Uh, yeah. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge, Carly. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Head on over to our website, naturalsuperkids.com for the show notes for this episode, as well as a whole heap of inspiration to help you raise healthy and happy kids. I'll see you next week.